Well, welcome in the name of Jesus to Chartridge. How lovely to be here. The war in Ukraine grinds on, and now there's war in Israel, and it's the main focus of the media. But there are very few prophetic speakers who seem to have insights that connect things to the Bible and explain them. And the explanations are not always very comfortable. But every prophet says repent, and you'll find it comes out from all of this. The theme is the spirit of Amalek. I don't think I chose it, but it goes like this. October the 7th shocked the world. And I started researching the Hamas covenant and the Quran afresh, thinking, I'm sure the way to expose them is to quote their own words. Because the reaction around the world is quite extraordinary. And the people who were waving Palestinian flags, Hamas flags, can only have been corrupted by the Quran and the Hamas covenant and not known the Bible, which is most people in the world. And the best way to defeat them is with their own words. So I spent about three weeks doing this. I looked up the Hamas covenant on the computer. It's all there, 14 pages. And it says, the Quran is our constitution. And there are phrases in their evil covenant that come from the Quran. So then I thought, well, I've heard that the Quran is not in chronological order. And it's difficult to read because you don't know what comes first, what comes last. But there is a verse which says that the later verses abrogate or override the early ones. And unless you know the sequence, you don't know which is the right verse. So you can preach peace, you can preach war out of the Quran, unless you know the sequence. When you do, it changes it. So I printed off two pages of the conversion from the internet, from Islamic sources, of the correct sequence for the early verses and middle and later ones. And then I thought, mm, well, that's still pretty difficult. So I went through the whole book in three weeks, reading it in chronological order and making notes. And I reduced it to eight pages from 500. I thought, to write to your MP or anybody else, you need something very short. The attention of an MP is a few seconds long. I know, because I was a civil servant of the Department of Transport. I had many, many a, a submission to ministers and conversations. So I reduced the 14 pages of Hamas down to that. And I reduced the Quran down to, I quoted six verses. The interesting thing is, of course, they didn't obey them. One clear black and white line is, Never should a believer kill a believer. And to them, a believer is a Muslim. And according to the internet, they have so far in Islam killed between two and 300 million, nearer 300 million people since 6, 615 or so AD. And they've killed more Muslims than non-Muslims. So they don't obey their Quran. And there's no abrogation of that verse. It's near the end. And so I've sent that to a number, a number of people, and the sun down there. If you want something to expose Hamas and the Quran with, that does it, I think, quite well. Where do I go with that? So there I was when I got a phone from Andy to say, could I come tonight? And I thought, well, the, the big issue in the world today is Israel, the Gaza war. We don't really want to go there, but it is the big issue in the news today, until the post office came along, <laughs> which was equally horrifying on a much smaller scale. But where do, we, where do we go from there? My mind was a bit blank until I read online that on Sunday the 29th of October, Benjamin Netanyahu made a speech in Hebrew. Have you heard this? Sometimes you all know everything I know and more. He made a speech in Hebrew. It's about a, about a 12 to 15 minute speech, it's on the internet, because what I read was that he had quoted the Bible. And I've heard it said he has a son who's a believer, who reads the Bible. Where he is, well, who knows where any, any Jew is, starting from where they start. But in the film, it was in Hebrew with English subtitles on YouTube. He said, and I watched it two or three times to get the words exactly right, 
He said to Israel, you must remember what Amalek has done to you, says our Holy Bible. I thought, where's that? Can you find that scripture in your mind straight away? I confess I used the computer to find it. And he didn't give the reference, but I found it in Deuteronomy 25, 17. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. This is, of course, Moses, Deuteronomy, speaking, and he wrote Deuteronomy before they went, began to enter the Promised Land, after they'd been in the wilderness for all those years, 40 years. And then you immediately think, as a careful Bible student, context. What's the context? What's before and after it? Well, verse 18. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. This was just after they left Egypt, okay? That's, what, that's when this happened. When the Lord your God gives you rest and mourn your enemies around you, verse 19, in the land he is giving you to possess as, as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So a few years later, after the wilderness, when Moses spoke and wrote out Deuteronomy, uh, that was, was printed, and they never did blot them out. This is actually moving on 370 years. I've got it as 1079 BC. Netanyahu then quoted 1 Samuel 15. And it's quite a read. So this is Samuel. Well, it's Yahweh speaking to Israel through Samuel, speaking to Saul through Samuel. The, the Lord said through Samuel to King Saul, who's just become king, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both woman and man, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. That is what Netanyahu said to Israel. It's a bit strong, slay them all, and they didn't obey that. That would have been genocide, slaying all the people in the Gaza Strip. Of course, we know they've tried hard not to do that, but that was what Netanyahu said. And I thought, what are we to make of this? Well, you know, the chapter continues with the story of Saul's victory and how he captured King Agag, but did not kill him. He'd been told to. And so the Lord took the kingship away from Saul. And Samuel killed King Agag. But clearly some Agagites and Amalekites lived on. So then I googled this man Amalek and the Amalekites, and I found the word occurs 48 times. We will just pick out 10. The first is in Genesis 14:7, about 1913 BC. This was where Lot was captured, and Abraham went and rescued him. The Amalekites lived down south in the Negev next to Egypt, which means that when they left Egypt, the Amalekites was the first tribe, other than Egyptians, they encountered. And the Amalekites fought against them. The second uh, place his name occurs is Genesis 36, 200 years later, where Esau's sons are named. That's the family tree to tell you where this man Amalek comes in. Well, it's not that complicated. You've got Abraham's father, Terah, well, you've got, first of all, the man of the ark, Noah, Shem, Arthak, Sed, and the others down to Terah and Abraham. And Abraham has a wife, Sarah, also Hagar. From Sarah, there's Isaac. And from Hagar, there's Ishmael. Isn't it interesting that Jacob has 12 sons, the 12 tribes, and Ishmael has 12 sons. And Abraham loved Ishmael, and he prayed, Oh God, won't you bless him too? And God said, I will, and he will be the father of 12 nations. So when I meet a, meet a Muslim man for discussion, I, I said, Do you know the names of Ishmael's 12 sons? No. Do you know he had 12 sons? No. You should read the Bible. You'd learn more about your Ishmael. And I handed him this. Just to try and get them to see there are, there's more truth 
a lot more than is in, in, in their book. And the man we're talking about, Amalek, is down here. He is descended from Esau through a woman, Ada, and no, I forget where she comes from. And then Eliphaz, and then Amalek. He's, he's Esau's grandson, and he's Abraham's great-great-grandson. That's where he is. So when he is fighting against the 12 tribes, they're closely related. And what does that make you think? I just thought of sibling rivalry. That's been the story of the Bible all through, sadly. That, that came in Exodus 17:8 about 1491, when they left Egypt, led by Moses, they were attacked by the Amalekites. A few years later, when we come to Deuteronomy, Moses said this line, remember what the Amalekites did to you. And that verse 19 of Deuteronomy 25, 25, 19, you shall blot out the memory of, of Amalek from under you, from under heaven, do not forget. An interesting verse as well is Numbers 33.55. In this verse, at the end of Numbers, Yahweh said, But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give you trouble in the land where you live. And then I will do to you what I plan to do to them. So they really were barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and the tribes opposing Israel have been opposing them ever since. So Yahweh knew they wouldn't all be driven out. And of course, Jesus said, wars will continue until the end. After that, we come to Joshua, to the book of Judges, and there's a but, a big but, after distributing this land. And it says in Judges, chapter 1, verse 27, Judges 1, 27, but Manasseh did not drive out the people of lots of places, several lines of it. That was Judges 1. Fifth reference is to Judges 3, 13. Moving on a hundred years or something. But the Amalites and the Amalekites attacked Israel and took Jericho. Okay? And then the sixth, Judges 6 and 7, Gideon defeated the Midianites and the Amalekites. But clearly they weren't all killed. Next, number 7, 1 Samuel 14, 48, just before 1 Samuel 15, Jonathan fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who had been plundering them. But of course we know only for a while. The next number eight is 1 Samuel 15, which Netanyahu quoted. That's about 1079 BC. And we know that Saul did not completely destroy the Amalekites because he took King, King Agag as a prisoner. But Haman the Agagite turned up in Babylon in about 510 BC in the book of Esther. And what was his aim? To completely destroy every Jew, right? That was Haman. And we know what happened to him. Number nine, 1 Samuel 30 and 2 Samuel 1, a long piece, 1056, where David defeated the Amalekites. It doesn't stop, does it? Nothing new under the sun. It just goes on and on. And the final reference is Psalm 83. Are you familiar with it? And so, Psalm 83. Oh God, do not keep silent. Be not quiet, O God. Be not still. See how your enemies are astir, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against those you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. Isn't that interesting? It's the complete opposite to what was to happen when the badges were to be destroyed. With one mind they plot together. They form an alliance against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, and Amalek. That's something like Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. Philistia and people of Tyre on the coast. Even Assyria has joined them. 
to lend strength to the descendants of Lot. I remember his descendants were the Moabites and the Ammonites. Do to them as you did to Midian, as you did to Caesar and Jabin at the river Kishon, who perished at Endor and became like refuse on the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, like all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna. They are mentioned in Judges 7 and 8, when Gideon took the crescent-shaped ornaments from around the horses' necks. The crescent-shaped idolatry was there then, which has become the symbol of, of Islam. Then verse 13, make them like tumbleweed, O oh my God, like chaff before the wind. Deal with them. Isn't that interesting? It seems that rivalry or rebellion began in the spiritual realm with Lucifer, Satan, rebelling in heaven. Therefore, he is in the Garden of Eden as a rebellious, rebellious demonic angel, deceiving, not with power, with cleverness, cunning, wanting to be worshipped. But before him, when first created, God saw it was all very good. Satan deceived Adam and Eve, and the next generation was even worse. Cain killed Abel. History is war after war. The spirit of God and the spirit of the enemy. Demonic Antichrist lives on opposing Jesus, wanting to be worshipped and glorified. But where does your mind go next? Maybe Ezekiel 38. It mentions a great northern alliance which appears to be forming now. But Yahweh will destroy them with torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur. The sort of punchline is, then they will know that I am Yahweh, that I am the Lord. God always has this heart for everyone. If only they'd repent. Then they will know. I tell you, this will happen, then you will know. It was the same with the Egyptians. He wanted them to come and believe. That was always God's aim that the world might know him and be saved. Zechariah 12, verse 3, when all the nations of the earth are gathered together against her, I will make Jerusalem, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. Look today at the UN. All the nations are coming together against Israel. Verse 9, Zechariah 12, verse 9, on that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. Chapter 13, verse 8. Zechariah 13, verse 8. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it, and he will strengthen them. Zechariah 14, verse 2. I will gather all nations, UN, to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured. Did you notice, I will gather all nations? It isn't, it isn't a case of Lucifer marshalling his troops to come against them. God sends them. We can have a very rosy, tinted picture of Israel and Christians and ourselves. Actually, of course, all have sinned. Do you know that in Israel there are a higher percentage of abortions than almost any other country in the world? I think most abortions follow sexual immorality. So they're children people don't want. So Israel is not an example in terms of behavior. And so I'm sort of saying, God says, I will gather all nations. It's strange. The Lord will do it. I will. And that took me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in this sequential flow. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where we have this line, they perish... They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. And what does the Bible say the truth is? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. And in John 17, that great prayer of Jesus, he said, Sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. So the truth is Jesus. The truth is the word. These are the true things, the absolute truths. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion, so that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned 
who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Not believed the truth, not believed the Bible, not believed in Jesus. Well, then I thought, verses for you after all that horrible stuff. The next verses of Thessalonians are definitely worth enjoying. But we ought always to thank God for you, Thessalonians representing believing people like you. Brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Verse 14, he called you to this through the gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father, one of those rare prayers to Jesus and the Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, may he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. I hope tonight will encourage you to remember that's the calling. Strengthen your hearts in every good deed and word. So all nations occurs all through this, these passages. This would seem to include America. America alone stands up for Israel in the UN. Without them, Israel will be exposed. No one to defend her except the Lord, of course. But Israel is a finely divided nation with an election coming. And, and uh, in the United States, it's the same. Back to Zechariah, chapter 14, second half of verse 5, about how then the Lord will come and all the holy ones with him. We know there won't be peace until then, because Jesus said, wars will continue until the end, until he returns. So when we pray for peace... We're almost praying against that. Because Jesus says wars will continue. I keep asking, how do we pray, Lord? We'll come back to that. But that's just like Revelation 19. Jesus comes back. The victory we know will be for Jesus. As the Bible says, the victory will be for Jesus. He won the victory at the cross over sin. He now has to complete the victory over the evil one. Did Yahweh always grant victory to the Jews? No, he did not. Yahweh warned in a verse I'm rather fond of, Habakkuk 1.6, which is about 626 BC. Habakkuk 1.6 warned that little prophet, I am sending in the Babylonians. I thought it was Jeremiah, I couldn't find it. It's Habakkuk 1.6, that warlike people who are fast on their horses with their swords. It fits the Muslims exactly. And God warned, but hang on, who sent them in? It's extraordinary, it says, I am sending in the Babylonians. God is in charge of these things a lot. The Archbishop was questioned about the COVID virus. Does your God send a virus? No, but he allows it to happen. But if he's sovereign, it comes to the same thing. And the Bible says he sends. When COVID came on, many people were quoting, do you remember 1 Chronicles 7, 14? If my people who are called by my name will repent. The big if there, but they never quoted the line before it. When I send the plague or the famine or the, desert, or the earthquake, when I send, God is in charge of the world and he effectively sends everything because he can stop them. And that gives us another picture of God. We don't fully understand, but he is so totally powerful and in control. We need to ha have an awesome respect for our God because this says that he is is he sending in Hamas? Can I really ask that question? Well, he sent in the Babylonians. Why can't he send in Hamas? Do those horrible things. Well, the Assyrians were just as bad as the Babylonians. But why would he send them in? Well, he's always saying, repent. And if they don't repent, and we tend to justify them, they were attacked, must defend themselves. Yes, and they couldn't do much else but defend themselves or else they'll be wiped out. Golda Meir said, if the Arabs um, destroy their arms, we'll have peace. If we destroy our arms, there'll be no Israel. So they have to either fight or die in the land. Uh, when the Amalekites fought Joshua, 
Saul, David, and the others, each time the Jews prayed, and they were victorious, God fought for Israel in those days. They prayed, not us. So I wonder, I suspect, more Jews are praying now. But that's, that's what happened then. When they prayed, they were victorious against the Amalekites. Now, I'm not saying that the Gaza people are Amalekites. It's the same spirit, isn't it? It's exactly the same spirit that wants to destroy Israel, the enemy spirit. Hamas have fired 13,000 missiles since October the 7th. And according to the Israelis, over 2,000 have fallen short into Gaza, a heavily populated civilian area. I wonder how many they've killed. Of course, they won't admit it. They blame Israel for every death. They've killed many of their own people. Wars will continue until the end. So how do we pray for Israel? Well, I have an answer to that. I think there's only one line in the Bible that really fits it. It's Romans 10.1. Paul prayed for his brother Jews. My prayer to God and heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. They might be saved. Not just live and win the war, but be saved. At the end of this life, we will be judged. And we go one of two ways. Hell or heaven, salvation or eternal punishment. And that was Paul's prayer for the Jews in the days when very few were believing and being converted. Word from Jerusalem. Has anybody heard of it? I thought you might all know it. I'm glad you don't. And the first big article is headed, Spirit of Amalek. And it doesn't add to what I've said, but it doesn't mention Netanyahu, but it's the same stuff. Spirit of Amalek and the war on Israel. And I thought, well, that's a nice sign, isn't it? Should I be sharing this stuff? Well, maybe that's, that's a sign. So that, was, so that was, to me, was an encouragement. And, but it didn't quite end there. On Friday this week, I received from Mr. Tony Pierce, who I think you all know, his Life for the Last Days. Has anybody else received it this week? You hand them out, Keith, don't you, sometimes, when it comes to you? Probably on its way to you. And he has an article, Gaza's War in the Future, and he goes into Psalm 83 far more comprehensively than I have. So if you get his book, you'll enjoy it. I haven't time to go further on that. We've been long enough. But I just thought that was a very neat thing to be timed like that. Further confirmation, perhaps. So the spirit of Amalek, or the evil spirit of Antichrist, clearly is still at work deceiving the world for all it can. And there is one evil spirit, one, because he said he would. And he always kept his word. Meanwhile, he said, in this life, you will have trouble. And I'm sure that he will keep that word too. So we pray for everyone. We hold fast to the truth and try to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Which reminds me, I read something, Protestant Alliance newspaper, about a man who was on his way to be killed in 1554. And he said, after all, it is no hardship to go to heaven. We all will, hopefully. I thought, what a lovely, light way to put it, as we get older. Some of us. My final verse would be a reminder. At the very end of 1 John, says this. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That we are so small, the serious believers in Jesus. Not trying to obey some rules, but trying to be led by the Spirit of Jesus. So, amen, shalom, in this troubled world. Amen.